All right, so wrapping up the 16-bit era, one thing we're going to talk about briefly here that we haven't touched on just yet was the launch of the Sega CD, which before we get into that, uh, I just remember being a kid and people were boasting like it was supposed to be like the next big thing because it was the first thing that was on CDs. So, you know, the big thing was there was going to be like enough room for quote unquote cinematic clips, more realistic graphics, better sound quality because it was supposed to be CD sound quality and a better color palette because you're again on a CD versus a cartridge. But as we go through this, we will talk about how it basically was a huge flop. Now, what I think, I don't know, I don't know if this would have had the capabilities or not, but what, what I felt could have made the, what we all refer to as basically the Transformer, that was the Sega Genesis with the CD with 32X, because you just keep stacking shit on there. I think what could have worked if it worked anyways, this is all theory, so bear with me. If the Sega CD was, like, basically the next gen, like, aka the Saturn, that you plugged your Genesis into it, so that way you can still get utilization out of your Genesis while having the brand new thing connected to it. So, like, oh, well, say you just, you know, your library for your Sega Saturn CD, whatever. We'll just call it the Sega Saturn that you plug into the Genesis. If you don't have enough games for that, you can still get usage out of your Genesis because it's right there and you don't have to have multiple consoles. I, I think that that was probably the intention with the Sega CD, but it was just piss poor execution, which caused it to just fail epically. So going on to <clears throat> our lovely... Hull wiki. The uh, Sega CD was released October 15th of 92, and it was at a retail price of two ninety nine. dollars Gosh, dang. Yeah, for back then, two ninety nine. dollars Woof. Man. Yeah, it's just an add-on for your Genesis. I'm mm -hmm. like, man, two ninety nine for not even a standalone console? Like, exactly. Wow. So it went on saying advertising included one of Sega's slogans, which was welcome to the next level, which I, I do remember seeing some of the commercials and like how, you know, they would make you know certain stuff look very intense and stuff, you know, fast paced and stuff just to try to sell it on you. But yeah, it definitely was not the case. So it says though only 50,000 units were available at launch due to production problems, the Sega CD sold over 200,000 units by the end of 92 and 300,000 by July 93 as part of Sega's sales blockbuster purchase Sega CD units for rental in their stores. Sega of America emphasized that the Sega CD's additional storage space allowed for full motion video games, with digital pictures becoming an important partner after the initial competition between Sega and Nintendo to develop a CD-based add-on, Nintendo canceled development of a CD add-on for the SNES after having partnered with Sony and then Philips to develop one. Which, uh, yeah, which will we will get to that a little bit uh, later as far as how that ends up coming into the fruition of the PS1 and all that jazz, yeah. but... Yeah, an intentional historical moment there. It definitely was too, man. It's, that's it's crazy when you think about it. So it goes on to say the Mega CD was launched in Europe in April of '93, starting with the United Kingdom on April 2nd, 1993, at a price of 269.99. The European version was packed with Soul Feast and Cobra Command in a two-disc set, along with a compilation CD of five Mega Drive games. Only 70,000 units were initially available in the UK, but 60,000 units were sold by August of 93. The Mega CD was released in Australia in March of 93. Brazilian toy company Tech Toy released the Sega CD in Brazil in October of 93, retaining the North American name despite the use of the name Mega Drive for the base console there. Goes on to say Sega released a second model, the Sega CD2 or Mega CD2 on April 23rd of 93 in Japan. It was released in North America several months later at a price of 
a whole two hundred and twenty nine dollars, and so you saved seventy bucks on that one. That was probably their way of saying, "Damn it, it's bombing." <laughs> And then it goes on saying bundled with one of the best selling Sega CD games, Sewer Shark. Yeah, because it was like a basically a Sonic bundled thing uh, designed to bring down the manufacturing costs of Sega CD. The newer model is smaller and does not use a motorized disc tray. A limited number of games were developed that used the Sega CD and another Genesis add on the 32X, which was released in November of 94, which we will also get to that as well. And it's like, it's so expensive, like over $200. Like I, again, I can only imagine how much it costs to like produce these. And then you're making all these and you're not even selling the ones you have. I think it's up there, it says they had uh, 70,000 units available in the UK, but only 60,000 were sold. <laughs> by August 93. I'm like, that's got to hurt, man. You just oh, got yeah. 10,000 units just sitting there, <laughs> not making any money. Yeah. All right, so going on to the decline of the Sega CD, it goes on to say, by the end of 93, sales of the Sega CD had stalled in Japan and were slowing in North America. In Europe, sales of Mega CD games were outpaced by games for the Amiga CD32, which that should just tell you something because, I mean... I know you're going to have your fanboys out there to go like, I love the Amiga. And it's like, I, I get it. Okay. But the fact is, is you were beating Nintendo. So the fact that Amiga is beating your, your device, that should be a huge kick in the pants. Um, newer CD based consoles, such as the 3DO interactive multiplayer rendered the Sega CD technically obsolete. Oh uh, yeah. I, I just remember hearing about the 3DO cause, uh, I think it was, I guess you could call it the, the Xbox One of its time, it was how powerful it was, and it was yeah. just a, it was just a <clears throat> hulking machine. Didn't have much in the way of games from what I remember, but it, I remember it being just like a technical monster that nobody was catching up with in terms of like you know what it was capable of. Yeah. So it goes on to say in late '93, less than a year after Sega CD had launched in North America and Europe, the media reported that Sega was no longer accepting in-house development proposals for Mega CD in Japan. By 94, 1.5 million units had been sold in the United States and 450,000 in Western Europe. Uh, Kalinsky blamed the Sega CD's high price for limiting its potential market. Sega attempted to add value in the U.S. and the U.K. by bundling more games with some packages, including up to five games. Now, I just wanted to know here that blamed the high price for limiting its potential market and yet again when we get to that point what the hell do you not learn from your mistakes with the sega cd and then when you launch the saturn what in the hell were you thinking you know what i mean <laughs> uh, it's a little funny i was like okay if that was the conclusion you came to before where yeah. was this guy <clears throat> they fire him between the, uh, here and when the saturn came out i don't know <laughs> I think the uh, the strategy when it comes to consoles, at least from what I remember or think, is that you, you want to sell them at a loss and make up the losses with the software, you know, the games that come out for them. I don't know if that was the case here. I don't know how expensive this stuff was to, to for Sega to develop initially, and because that's the only that's the only justification I can think of for having such a high price on any of this stuff. Right. Because you, you burn out your customers' wallets by the time the next thing comes out. Like, I just spent however much money on the Genesis. Mm -hmm. And then another whatever for the 32X. Yep. And then 202 to 300 for the uh, the CD add-on. And now here's the Saturn. Like, you think I'm made of money, dude? Like, well, uh, that, well, that's the whole thing, yeah. Because when you do the timeline, I mean, you got Genesis was 89. Then it, uh, Sega CD says 90, uh, 91. So that's two years later. So now you're one. So in two years, you're like, oh, drop another 300 bucks. Why not? And then in another two years, you get the 32X. And I we'll get to the price on that. But I believe that was like 150 bucks or 200 bucks for that add-on. And then, oh, yeah, that's right. A year after that, you get the Saturn for a whopping 399. Like, what the f were you thinking? <laughs> it's like what happened with the Wii U, but on crack. Oh, yeah. I mean, God, you got a matter of six years. You got four things that got released. That's crazy. And not to mention, you have the Game Gear as well. Oh, yeah. The, the <laughs> I mean, you got that, I'm too. Sure that cost a hundred something dollars. Oh, I'm probably, yeah, between the, I'd probably say 150, 200 bucks, I'm sure. But yeah. So yeah. it goes on. 
to talk about. It says in early 95, uh, Sega shifted its focus to the Sega Saturn and discontinued advertising for Genesis hardware, including the Sega CD. Sega discontinued the Sega CD in the first quarter of 96, saying that it needed to concentrate on fewer platforms and that the Sega CD could not compete due to its high price point uh, and outdated single-speed drive. According to Thorpe, the Sega CD only reached a more popular price point in 95, by which time uh, customers were willing to wait for newer consoles. The last scheduled Sega CD games, Ports of Mist, which I, I don't want to go down the rabbit hole too much, but those types of games just bore the dog crap out of me, and Brain Dead 13, which I don't know what that is, were canceled. 2.24 million Sega CD units were sold worldwide, which, to be fair, as much as that sounds like a big number, it's really not when you're talking worldwide. If they would have said in yeah. the United States, that's different. But when you say worldwide, not so much. But the 32X was even worse. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty bad. 2 million worldwide. I'm like, look, man. Like, it, especially depending on how big the customer base was for your competition. Yeah. Like, I don't, whatever the number was for a Nintendo, the NES, or Super, Indi uh, Super Nintendo Worldwide. Yeah. Pretty sure completely dwarfs that number. And ugh, that's not good. You're not making any of that money back. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you just took a huge, huge loss on all of that. That is for sure. Going to our lovely 32X that you can see here. So it goes on to say, Sega unveiled the 32X at the Consumer Electronics Show in June of 94. So mind you, June of 94, but then the Saturn hits a year later. So just keep that in mind. So it says, and presented it at a low cost option for 32-bit games. It was developed in response to the Atari Jaguar and concerns that the Saturn would not make it to the market by the end of 94. Though the 32X was conceived as a new standalone console at the suggestion of Sega America executive Joe Miller and his team, it became an add-on for the Genesis and made more powerful. The final design contained two 32-bit central processing units and a visual display processor. Before I carry on, that was the whole thing. Uh, cause it was in a different wiki that I, I don't have up and I don't know where the hell I found it. But, um, I remember reading, uh, in the past that, uh, Sega Japan was not happy about the 32X whatsoever. They didn't even want Sega America to do it, but Sega America said, yeah, you know what, but we want to do it anyways, because we feel it's the right thing to do. And we can try to quote unquote market it as a uh, basically a poor man's 32-bit console. So if, it's like, well, if you can't afford the Saturn, you can afford this, but it's not the same experience. <laughs> so it's like, it's just like it's you're bamboozling your your customer, basically. You know? Yeah, I, and I think that might be part of like what was really messing with Sega. There was like uh, two different mindsets when it came to uh, making and selling these uh, systems. Yeah, you have Japan and then you have America. And I'm sure America was thinking like, well, we understand our market and we know it's going to do well because we know what we like. Yeah, and it doesn't do well. Yeah, and it's probably a lot of miscommunication there. And they go Japan wanted to do things a certain way, and it was just a lot of clashing. That sounds like a bad experience if you work under that type of leadership. Correct. Or lack thereof. Yeah, exactly. So it goes on to say that the 32X failed to attract third-party video game developers and consumers because of the announcement of the Saturn's simultaneous release in Japan. And again, for those that don't know, if you haven't caught up with us to this point or don't know the history of stuff, typically it was always Japan got stuff before we did. And it would always be like back then because, again, you didn't have the internet. So you would basically hear about stuff that was getting released in Japan, you would read about it in some video game magazines, so that way it was kind of like it would build the hype for when it got released in the Americas. So at the time of the 32X getting released, we were also hearing about the Sega Saturn, so most people have a little thing called common sense, go, why don't I just wait till the Saturn comes? Like, I, why, why waste the money on this? It doesn't make sense. So that's kind of what they were getting at there. So Sega's efforts to rush the 32X 
to market cut into time for game development, resulting in a weak library of a whopping 40 games that did not fully use the hardware, including Genesis ports. Sega produced 800,000 32X units and sold an estimated 665,000 by the end of 94, selling the rest at a steep discounted rate until it was, con or excuse me, discontinued in 1996 as Sega turned its focus to the Saturn. Also, one thing I just wanted to note here for those of us that like to collect things, if you don't have a 32X, I personally would suggest trying to acquire one if you can. I'm not saying you have to use cash value. You can always try to trade or something like that. But nonetheless, I would say it would be worth trading for for collection value because as you see, the numbers are extremely low. Right, so they only produced 800,000, period. And how many of those are in landfills or just damaged units? Probably at least, what, 50%? We would probably, it was a safe, safe bet. So out of the 800,000 produced, you have at least half of them are dead and gone. On a good estimation, you got about 400,000 in circulation period so if you can get your hands on one that's in good condition you know looks pretty good like i'll be honest i got mine originally to flip but when i realized how many were in circulation i was like you know what i'm gonna keep this for myself <laughs> yeah you might be do better doing that because uh yeah if you coming across another one it's gonna decrease day by day right so. right and i don't mean to induce like panic on anybody it's not like they're going anywhere anytime soon but i'm just saying you know <laughs> if you can if you have the means i mean i would just keep that on your radar or something to just put on the checklist for retro collecting and all that stuff carrying on just the 32x is considered a commercial failure of course uh, initial reception was positive highlighting the low price and power expansion to the genesis however Later reviews, both contemporary and retrospective, were mostly negative because of its shallow game library, poor market timing, and its market fragmentation of the Genesis. Super Retro Force.